Hello, hello. Hello, Saray. It's Jeff. Hey. So today we're talking with Jim Bass Knight. Yes, we are. So we know Jim Bass Knight through Pat Thomas, who we've had on our show. Jim's yep. been playing music since the late 70s. So he, yep. this guy's yeah. got like 40 years of experience doing power pop music. So you know this guy has got, first of all, a lot of music to share, a lot of stories to share, but also just a lot of opinions to share about where music was and where it is. Yeah, and, and he's currently living in Washington State, but he spent some time in New York and in Los Angeles, so he's got both coasts. So I'm interested in talking a little bit about that. And finding out the differences between, you know, these different locations and what, what it's like making music in these areas. Very nice. Well, let's get to it then. All right. Hi, this is Soraya. And this is Jeff. Our podcast is called Paisley Stage Raspberry and Rhyme. A podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tunes. We hope you'll join our conversation. And without further ado, agroviar. Let's get groovy. All right, we'll add Jim to the call. Hello, this is Jim. Hello, Jim. This is Jeff. And Soraya. <laughs> How are you? What's going on? We're doing right. great. We're really excited to have you on the show to talk about your new album and a few other things. But we have a little brief introduction before we get started. On today's show, we're talking to Jim Bass Knight. Jim has recently released a new CD entitled Not Changing on Precedent Records. He's been writing, yep. recording, performing power pop music since the late 70s with Moberly's, The Rockinghams, and as a solo artist. So today, Soraya and I are hoping to learn a little bit more about what inspires Jim to record music for past, what, 40 years, if I'm calculating right. So Jim, we want to welcome that, that's you. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to say welcome to Paisley Stage, Raspberry and Rhyme. I'm really, really happy to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I just, if I, sorry about interrupting you, I'm just, I'm excited to get it, get involved with this conversation. And, uh, so I'll try to keep my, keep my mouth shut until you're done asking me questions. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Um, okay. Jim, we do want to talk to you about your new album, Not Changing, but before we get into that, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about geography and where you've been yeah. playing music over the years. So it's our understanding that you've made the rounds around the country, starting in Washington State, then New York, Los Angeles, and now back to the Pacific Northwest. That's was correct. it music that drove you to make these moves across the country? Yes, it was, absolutely. Um, and that that's just the way, the way it was for me, and it still is. We moved out here when I was a real small boy, just as I was entering into you know school, and I grew up in the Seattle area and went through you know through high school in the Seattle area. But shortly after that, um, I moved to New York City uh, when I was 19 years old, and uh, and then lived there off and on between that time and until I was about uh, 25 years old. So um, just kind of my early 20s, a little bit into my late teens in New York and and also Seattle. And uh, I went and visited L.A. and also, uh, you know, down California, San Francisco and stuff like that. But I didn't really live there uh, until later. And, you know, I was always, you know, pretty close to the Seattle scene, too, as well as, as trying to kind of make a, a mark in New York City. And uh, so kind of going back and forth and with limited means, just working really hard. And it was at a time when if you, you know, really worked hard, you could do that in New York City. But things have changed quite a bit since then. But um or Seattle for that matter. Um, but what's going on, why why I went to New York, it was really simply because I was so inspired by the music of New York City, uh, the legacy of, uh, you know, the Velvet Underground and CBGBs and Max's Kansas City and the New York Dolls and, and, uh, and all that kind of music, television and all that kind of, kind of stuff. And also just um, rock and roll, it was... Seattle was kind of provincial back then. It was it was it was a very great place and a fun place, but it sort of had a kind of a self defeating attitude about original music and, and a lot of other things. And so I really wanted to kind of be where things were at, you know, and, and kind of make and really find out about that about the big city. And uh, 
I just felt more inclined towards New York than LA at that time because um, um, I had sort of had roots there growing. Uh, my mother grew up there and stuff, and I had some family back there, so I kind of was to seem more connected to it, and you know, just had some relatives and stuff like that. But uh, just it was a great challenge, you know. I, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I saw a ton of great shows and played with a lot of great musicians and met a lot of good friends, and uh, and uh, you know, didn't really get the big deal I was looking for necessarily. But you know, I don't think the music business in general got the big deal they were looking for either. I think everything kind of went sideways in New York City. I mean. Rock and roll was really big in the 70s and, and the, maybe into the early 80s, but it really started changing to um, to dance. And uh, and I, I was really into the early rap stuff that was going on there when I was hanging out there and stuff, too. It was really, I thought it was a, a real creative time and in that world, too, But um, and a lot of other kinds of music. But it just seemed like it kind of went away from rock and roll, the kind of rock and roll that I like, electric guitars and you know, harmony vocals and drums and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I just kind of, as I saw that kind of happening, I just kind of, along with other people that I was working with at the time, like the late Dave Drury, I um, decided to kind of go back to Seattle and kind of regroup. And then within about a year and a half, we moved down to LA. Oh, wow. That was in 85. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I moved to Seattle in early 84 from back, I mean, kind of for the last time. You were in Los Angeles around 1985? I moved to Los Angeles in 1985. I got a job at Tower Records on Sunset. Wow. And uh, I didn't have a car. I was living in Hollywood, about a block south of Man Chinese Theater, and taking a bus to work. And then we were rehearsing over on uh, Santa Monica and Western at uh, Dean Chamberlain's studio, um, and a bunch of other famous bands were, were rehearsing their Red Hot Chili Peppers and Guns N' Roses and uh, Jane's Addiction and a lot of other bands, Fishbone. And so, you know, we were kind of in good company and we did a couple of demo recordings there and stuff and uh, um, just did a lot of did a lot of music at that in that rehearsal room and, and started playing gigs around Hollywood and, and thereabouts. and. Uh, and uh, you know, open for some some good bands and play with some good bands. Uh, like the open for the Liars when they came through town. It was open for the Flesh Tones because I knew them through Alan Vega, who was a friend of mine, the late Alan Vega in New York, and and uh, and then played a bunch with a lot, bunch of other bands. Uh, became friends with the Plim Souls and a couple other cool local bands. The Fuzz Tones moved out to L.A. and. Um, uh, Mike Chekai, who was the drummer from the Fuzz Towns, is one of my all-time best friends and, and people that I've worked with and written songs with. And so he and I had worked together back east a little bit, quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And then uh, so we kind of kept starting, got back into writing songs and hanging out together when he moved out there with Rudy Potrudy and John Carlucci, who was also a friend of mine, too, from New York and was in that band, too. And I sort of made friends with some of the other guys. And, and you know, there was just a lot of good, good bands and the, the and we were doing a lot of the music and writing a lot of songs. I met some really great people there that I started writing songs with, like Joey Alkes, who wrote A Million Miles Away with Peter Case, and um, Pat DiPuccio, who's one of my, still one of my best friends, who lives in Nashville now, but he's been was in a bunch of LA bands going back to the, the beginning. He, in fact, he was one of the people that started Flipside Magazine. But oh, wow. he and I wrote some good songs together, and I worked with a bunch of other folks and. I mean, it's just it's a kind of a long story, but tell me what else you want to know about it. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I'm glad that you mentioned about all the songs that you've written. Looking at your discography, it's quite extensive. Between your solo releases and what you've done with the Rockinghams and the Moberlys date back to, I think the first single was released in 77, Live in the Sun. I 
So that was my solo single. Um, what happened was also I'd like to mention Tommy Knight too, who actually is a guy that was involved heavily in I think it's uh, three of the of the songs on the new album, if I'm, if not four. I have to look at it real quick to see one, two, three. Uh, I think it's four. But um, um, he, he's a guy that was kind of hooked up with that Kim Fowley scene early on in LA, and he just you know started writing songs together, really heavy duty when the mobile release kind of started pretty much kind of fell apart in 89 and we did, did a lot of writing there too but get um i'm sorry i didn't go mean to sidetrack what was your question i want to no. make sure you got a shout out go ahead i'm sorry no not a problem uh, thanks for that what, clarification what was your question oh your question was about uh, this the first single okay yes so what happened was so i moved i had a band uh in the first original band i ever had it was with some uh, two guys and, and one girl that I went to school with and grew up with in, in Seattle called The Mice. And we sort of rose out of this scene in Seattle. It was kind of a small scene amongst a bunch of kids that were into, I, I guess you call it proto-punk, you know, like the dolls and the velvets and, and uh, you know, um, that early punk stuff, Bowie, T-Rex and all that kind of stuff, Roxy Music. And uh, Stooges, of course. And so we kind of came out of that, but we were kind of also real heavily into like the Beatles and the Kinks and and uh, the Who and and all that all that British uh, pop. And so um, what happened was we got this band together. We had a band actually, me and Paul Hood, who uh, is in a, a mostly instrumental band now called the Toiling Midgets. He's been with them forever since the seventies, I believe, too, or late seventies, early eighties. But um, um, and he's been touring over Europe with them. But he he and I were good buddies growing up and and playing sports and hanging out and listening to records together and stuff like that. And we started this band with the drummer, who was a, a guy who had a little fanzine in the U District, which is a, a, an area of Seattle that we all grew up around, pretty close to. We had most of the record cool record stores in town and stuff like that. Um, and his, uh, his name was Lee Lumsden, and he had a little fancy called Chatterbox. And actually, it was called the District Diary before that, but then it became named Chatterbox after the New York Dolls' Johnny Thunder song. So we, um, you know, we had this little magazine. We were interviewing bands that would come through town, and we were kind of getting in on the 
on the scene of you know trying to meet rock stars when they came to town and interview them and we were kind of get sort of becoming notorious to some of the local music press and music visitors and stuff like that and they kind of took took a liking to us and sort of felt sorry for us and kind of helped us out in there and we had this little mimeograph fanzine and stuff like that and then but then we started playing music together and, and with this band the mice and as i started writing songs in my senior year of high school and uh, Paul sort of followed suit, and Lee was always a poet, and he had started writing music to his lyrics, and and we just came up with this stuff. And then my girlfriend Jenny was involved too, and she was a sort of a harmony singer uh, and sang lead on a couple tunes. We kind of had sort of a, I guess you call it a feel. We thought we were kind of going for sort of the Velvet Underground thing, um, but it was it was kind of arty. The only song that um, that is represents of that that you can hear on you there's two of them on YouTube. One of them is called Brown Skin. at school. recording and I re did a couple of those songs in the mob release but that was this band the mice and our first show was actually the first self-promoted DIY punk show on the west coast according to a number of historians it was actually predates the LA stuff wow. a little bit actually one of the bands that the band that played after us at that show was the Tupperwares. They became the Screamers down in LA. They moved down there shortly after that and started this kind of scene that got a scene going down there at a place called The Mask, I guess, which was the up and coming early kind of punk place to hang out. That sprung out a lot of bands. But the what happened there was that we did the show that, you know, with them and another band called the Telepaths and the most famous member of the Telepaths was a guy named Bill Reefland, who was in R. E. M. and Ministry and a bunch of other cool bands, but and a number of other people that are worth noting, unfortunately, many of whom have left us. But um, and so that group of people um, had the, did the show, which was sort of a the, the a historic show, and that was the mice first gig. And our last gig was less than a year later. Um, we opened for the Ramones the first time they played in Seattle. Wow! And that was our last gig. And and Jenny was replaced by Pam Lillig, who's a pretty noteworthy uh, music person in LA now. She's a VP at uh, uh, BMG um, Chrysalis, I think it's called now, but she, she does a lot of work with that. Uh, She's she getting cool music on commercials and things like that, movies and stuff. So um, anyway, um, so she became a guitar player and she played Les Paul Jr. and she was kind of that, that Johnny Thunders vibe and she was pretty cool. So we did that, she and I and, and Lee and Paul and we, and then the band broke up after that Ramon show because I decided I wanted to move to New York. So hence I moved to New York 
and I hung out with the Ramones quite a bit. I was able to stay at the road manager, Arturo Vega, the late Arturo Vega's loft work that he shared with Joey Ramone when they were on the road. Other than that, I stayed in a bunch of rough places. <laughs> and so I'm actually pretty, met some very cool people along the way and uh, did some pretty cool stuff. And was, that was kind of my first go around in New York. And then I came back about six months later and everybody in New York at that point was putting out singles and it was this kind of thing that's going on in England everybody was doing singles and there was even some singles starting to happen in California and so I decided to do a single you know I decided I was going to do, do one in Seattle so I did pretty much one of the first ones in Seattle like a punk single you want to call that and that was that one we're talking about Live in the Sun back with She Got Effed so yes. there you go yes. I don't know if this is going on the radio or whatever but yeah <laughs> you can so say that was, you yeah. want <laughs> Okay, she got fucked. It was, and I, you know, I got to admit, I loved Wayne County at the time. That now Jane County and and Wayne had a record called uh, "Fuck Off." So I felt if Wayne could do that, I could do it. So there we go. But um, the long and short of it is, uh, but my my song actually predates me knowing about "Fuck Off." So, but anyway, um, so um, I put out that single, and then I you know, was getting some good kind of buzz around town, just kind of. You know, not really, didn't really have a band. Um, didn't really decide to get back with the mice. Just kind of just sort of looking around for a new band. And finally, after playing with a couple of different, uh, you know, bands that never got off the ground, I played with some very cool people and just kind of tried some stuff here and there, did some guest spots and some shows and things like that. I got together with the band that became the Moberlies, and that kind of evolved over a course of about a year. And then we started playing, uh, we did one gig at, at a at a bar and then um and then we did uh our second gig was at a big huge theater in seattle the paramount theater which is a big was a big deal for all of us growing up to play to be in the paramount that was a big deal for us and you know and we played a lot of with a lot of famous bands you know over the course of another year that we were together basically and then uh and then that band kind of fell apart but uh a guy that uh had been sort of a big fan of ours and a friend of ours who worked at a record store in, in Seattle, uh, you know, helped to put out an album in hopes that the band would get back together or, you know, something good would happen. And he, and so I put out that first Moberly's album that you've probably seen on my discography. And that was, that came out in, it, the date on the record says 79, but it came out in January of 80. And the single actually came, it was actually on the street uh, in January of 78. So. Uh, they both have the wrong date on them, but who cares about that? Anyway, so that's that's the story of those two records. What else? <laughs> <laughs> I could keep going, and I could tell you about more about them if you want. Well, but I want, I'm talking too long. Sorry. No, 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 no. You are giving us exactly what we want, so okay. please, it's all good. But I do have a a, a little bit of a piggyback question, uh, Jim. Good. There's so many releases, you know, over over you know all these different times and you know your own influences and your own style changing with it do you have mm -hmm. do you have one release that you're the most proud of or are you saying like this this most recent album is really the best work that i have you know something i i really do think that this this most recent album is really good and um i don't know that i'm qualified to say what the best one is I think I, I prefer that somebody else makes that decision, but I've done, this is my eighth album and I'm very proud of this new album. I'm really proud of it. I'm also very proud of, of, uh, of a number of other, my, my albums. And I, I, some of them I think maybe are, you know, it's hard for me to really know what's of value. So, um, I guess maybe the one that probably is, seems like the least important is the one that put out before this new album, which was called Introducing Jim Bassnett, which was sort of a run through like this huge amount of recording I've done, some of which with bands that really never got off the ground that were sort of stoppy starty that, and some of which were just songs that really didn't fit a specific band were, were really, really good songs that I thought had a lot of value, but just didn't really fit a certain kind of motif of a certain album that was going on at the time. It was kind of an odds and ends, kind of odds and sods or whatever you want to call it, kind of an album. And so it's, you know, I mean, that might not be as appealing, but I think every other one of my albums has a lot of appeal. Um, although I think there's a bunch of good songs in that one. I think mm -hmm. it would be good for people to listen to just for to hear songs and to hear cool ideas. I just don't know if it's quite the album listen that my new album is or that 
you know, some of the other ones too, like the first two Moberly CDs, um, Sex Teen in Seattle, New York, LA, there's tons of great stuff on there, but they're kind of like, they're so full. There's so much stuff on there, like 23 or 25 songs or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like with a lot of CDs, it's like there's going to be some tracks that you want to skip over. Right. You know, but I think with the new album, honestly, I just, I don't feel that way about any of the songs, at least yet. You know, I'm, who knows? Maybe someday I'll, I'll <laughs> siphon it down to just three or four that I really want to hear. But right now I'm really, I'm really into all of them. And, um, and I'm hoping other people are, are feeling that way too. Nice. Absolutely. Nice. Sexteen is a great album, by the way. So I wanted to talk about la Thank you. labels. So Jim, although your material has been released on several different labels, including the French label Lolita and other labels like mm -hmm. Rave Up, ATM, Pop the Balloon, Safety First, and most recently Big Stir helped mm -hmm. release one of your singles. Most of your music mm -hmm. has been released on Precedent Record. Is that your own label? Yes, it is. It's a label that I established when I put out that first single uh, in 1977. And it's just, a, you know, it's been in business since then. And I've never released anything else but my own music on it. It's just been basically my label to put stuff out. You know, I was signed to EMI uh, Records in 1987. And we did a bunch of recording with Peter Buck producing. And, uh, and uh, the labels... Um, merge with another label and they the guy that was the a and guy you know I really love this but um the kind of the upper end people wanted to get away from rock and roll so they dropped a bunch of their rock acts most of them actually at that time um and we're kind of wanting to go more for like dance and and that kind of stuff and uh and so uh we kind of we kind of got dropped before we got a chance to really finish the album, which was kind of too bad. It kind of hurt the band. But that was the Mo release, um, but um, no, nothing ever came out on their label. But uh, they actually gave me all the masters, and I released that stuff on other on other releases. But um, you know, so I just I just you know I'm always looking for you know someone to help me out to do this stuff. But uh, I'm also you know somebody that you know I've done this now. For a long time and i've made a living at it and the world that i came into this with in 1975 or whenever it was i graduated from high school and started deciding that i wanted to play music you know for my career um you know it was way different than the world today and back then there was roadies and managers and labels and and uh you know sound people and all this other kinds of stuff. And now it's just me. I do it all publicist. I just, I do everything, all of that. And, and because I can't really afford to hire somebody and I need to look at this as a business so I can, so I can make a living. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know if that's maybe suited to the world today in some respects, because I sell CDs of my shows and I do all that. But I'm sure that somebody could market me and do a lot better than I do myself. That's for sure. But I'm, I just, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm still, I'm still waiting for that opportunity. All right. Hey. Well, I do want to talk about um, not changing and I, Sure. I do want to ask one quick question about the song uh, Never Get Lost. Taking the one at a 
changing but it was also released on big stir so how yep. did you get involved with uh big stir and uh the label owners rex and christina oh well they are uh it's funny because i uh I, I was just kind of when i started getting together this album and put it you know finished it mastered it um i put it out there digitally um and i started getting it out there and kind of started networking just on facebook and they were one of the people that, you know, sort of took notice and, you know, so I sent them a copy and, and they just liked it. And we started talking and, and, uh, as it turns out, they were mutual friends of, of a guy that I mentioned before, Patrick DiPuccio, who, um, who I wrote a, a song, a couple, few songs, but in the past one song that was on my first CD album. And he, you know, he said, yeah, that'd be great. You should, you should get involved with Jim. Jim's a good guy or whatever he said to them. And then, and then we kind of agreed to do this. And then uh, uh, also hit, uh, chose his song as the B-side, which is called Restless Night. It's a song that he and I wrote quite a while ago. And, um, and so that, uh, that was, uh, that's kind of more or less how it happened. I became more as time's gone, I've gotten to know Rex and uh, and Christina, and uh, I really I really think they're doing great stuff with their label and uh, and I'm, I'm that song both uh, both those songs are on their their new compilation they're putting out here and uh, I hope to do more work with them in the future. They're just great people. They they you can tell they really love doing what they're doing and it, it's a good fit for who I'm, where I'm coming from right now. Nice. Right. And they seem to have a lot of respect for their artists. So that's yeah. something special about Big Stir. So they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they do. I don't know much about the whole overall operation or what they're doing, but as far as how they're dealing with me, just between how things are working with me and how they do things, it, it just really seems like it's a good fit for the way things are in in the world right now of music. And, um, you know, I, I obviously I think that my stuff is, is really good strong and i think that you know at least i think there's enough there's some highlights in it and i think with the right marketing something could happen Mm -hmm. um but at the same time you know i don't know if you can tell by listening to my music i'm not really that concerned about trends or just following like running out there and finding out who needs a commercial and what kind of music they need for it and and Mm -hmm. trying to write that i'm just doing music that is me you know i'm just doing the music that's me and and as that evolves i think that's probably the best way for me to go and you know as a music historian as somebody who's written a book about sonny boy williamson who was one of the most important figures in in american music history because he introduced blues to uh broadcast media really and he had a lot to do with uh uh, the british invasion and all the british blues guys that really you know blue rock and roll wide open in the in the late 60s and the 70s i mean he he was a real important figure and and 
no one cared about him at all. So, I mean, I look at myself and people have given me a pretty good, a good road in that sense that, you know, I've, I've had a lot of write-ups and people know who I am. I have at least something I can move forward with. He never even had anybody give him a concert preview or a record review or a, an interview and like that in, in an American uh, journal of note or any sort of news organization in his lifetime, except for just a couple of oddball things. You know, and that was at a time that blues wasn't really hit, you know, and it was kind of very much dismissed. But at the same time, you know, I look at somebody's life like that and I think, well, you know, I'm not trying to martyr myself, but I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm just going to stick with what I do. And if the time comes that my music would really, you know, it catches on somewhere and, and, and really makes somebody do something with it, you know, that's great, but I don't really want to change who I am to try to make that happen, to try to force that to happen. Nice. Yeah. So, Jim, Soraya broke the seal about talking about not changing, which was released on precedent mm-hmm. earlier this year. It's been quite a few years since the last album, Introducing Jim Bass Night, that you were talking about earlier. That came out in 2012. Have you spent the last seven years writing and recording, not changing? Not really. Um, basically, what happened was... Um, I spent that last, I spent, well, here's all this to give the brow break it down for you. In 1998, the Rockinghams kind of, kind of sort of disbanded. Um, and uh, that was a band that I was playing with around Seattle in the nineties. And I was also doing a bunch of solo shows in the nineties too, after I moved to Seattle and I started kind of putting together sort of an acoustic kind of a band with a trumpet player and a violin player and a, a bass stand up bass player and that kind of an approach and a acoustic guitar and that kind of grew into sort of a band thing after the Moberly after the uh, Rockinghams kind of fell apart um or sort of you know kind of went on went our own ways kind of and uh, uh well we put out this uh an album that Make and Bake and I think that came out in 98 it was again it was right when the band was was pretty much kind of going going away but um so that that um that was when that was kind of falling apart and so i got that band together and i put together uh put that band and and did a bunch of recording um as well during that time that the rock games were kind of you know doing their thing too and i put two albums out pretty close together that jim bass night thing and the Rock and Games Make and Bake, and those, I think the Rock and Games Make and Bake came out in 98, and I think that the Jim Besson thing came out in 90, or 97, or whatever, it was right in that time I was doing doing those, um, I don't know if I have the dates in front of me, you do, I'm sure, but at any rate, it was, they both came out at that same time, and so I was kind of doing, I was out working and playing gigs, and I, I moved out of Seattle to a small town north of Seattle, kind of out in the suburbs, kind of he was out in the country, really, uh, called Stanwood, and and uh, with my ex-wife, and uh, I just kind of changed my life around. I became more of a live music person and less focused in the original music scene in Seattle, and um, I just started working on the road, and I became like a road guy, road musician, and just so I traveled out there. With at that time, I had a pretty good, you know catalog of of original music and sort of a good story to tell of things that I've done in my career and I just basically went out there and played every little town in this whole region it's a huge region up here from Montana to Idaho to Wyoming to Utah to Oregon Washington you know this whole area playing every little secondary market every little small town that had a good gig or resort or whatever was going on um, and that's what I kind of became and that sort of and as that was kind of happening I put together this album with some of the musicians that I knew over time in Seattle and some of whom who were playing with me doing get live gigs and that was Recovery Room and that that was that came out in about 2004 I think it was yeah 2004 and then I just be, I just solidly was doing this traveling and then um, o- over time, I, people started contacting me, uh, and this guy in Japan um, wanted to put out like a Best of the Mo release, so I did that in 2006, and at the same time, another uh, company in Italy wanted to put out a vinyl Mo release kind of Best of, and I put that out, and that was in, I think, the same time, about the same time, 2006 or so. And 
in the and uh, you know I put out a Moberly's uh, compilation also in the early 2000s called Seattle New York LA on a French label called Pop the Balloon and uh, and then this uh, this German Moberly thing had come out um, on a, the Bear Family ATM label in 97 I believe it was. And, uh, and so I had all these records and I was just out traveling and playing all the time and just gigging all the time. And I kind of stopped kind of focusing on, on really recording a new album so much as I was just really always just doing shows and traveling and, you know, saving money and I, and doing other stuff like writing, um, journalism kind of stuff on the side, you know, in between shows, like when I was on the road, like after shows and just, <laughs> just anything to, to kind of save money. And I, I build a house, the house I'm living in now, um, in a, this little small town called Indianola. I moved in here in about 2007, 2008, I think I moved in finally. Um, and so I was just constantly gigging and not so much really putting out new material other than, you know, a best of thing, which I did with um, Mike Stewart in New York from the, um, who owns the beauty bar there in New York City. And uh, he put up this best of my career called We Rocked and Rolled. And I was just kind of, you know, just had to put together a really good show and uh, not really focusing that hard on putting out new product. And then in 2012, um, I put out uh, that introducing Jim Bassett was just kind of sort of, you know, cleaning the, the, uh, the backlog. I've actually recorded like five new tracks. I was like, I did do five new songs and then I kind of released sort of a cleaning house on all the, uh, the tapes and the songs that hadn't been released. That I thought were of value. There's still plenty that I have that I've decided not to release, but, um, you know, so that was kind of it in 2012 and it, right at that same time I got this job researching Sonny Boy Williamson for this company. And so I did that for about five years on top of gigging. And so my head just really wasn't into doing anything new as far as recording. No one was saying, hey, come and record an, a new album. And I was just busy, you know, raising a kid um, who's now just starting college in the fall um, and other things and just basically just working all the time. And then, uh, the Sunny Boy thing kind of ran into some problems in 2017 when the guy that ran the company uh, he passed on. He got he just he just died and uh, had to deal with some some difficult issues with his estate to try to finish the project. So it was kind of stuck in neutral. And I had, I have in fact done that and figured out which way to go with it and sort of take it on myself and use what I've done and make some products happen. You know, still kind of working on finishing that, but you know, I have sort of a path, but. At that time, when he passed on in, in November of, oh, excuse me, in uh, January of 2017, I kind of had time on my hands and a lot of creative energy. So I just started putting together the songs for, uh, for Not Changing. And by a year later, I had about 40 songs um, plus, 40 plus songs. Wow. And Gary Shelton, who played bass on a lot of my stuff over the years, and has been like this sort of engineer co-producer on all the stuff I've recorded, most of it, uh, up here in Seattle since I moved from LA in 92. And he just helped me put this whole thing together in the studio with a, a really unique concept of recording. And uh, I can tell you about that if you want to know about what the concept was of how we did it. But yes. just to finish your question, I got that all together in the space of about a year, had this kind of just sort of this misplaced creative energy from you know, the Sunny Boy project sort of just stopping and I had all this creative energy going and so I just put together these songs and uh, put together these recordings uh, shortly after that, started recording with, with Gary and with uh, uh, Dave Warburton, who's been a drummer that has worked with the uh, the sort of reunion Moberly band uh, since unfortunately Dave Drury passed away. We did, did a, a reunion uh, thing and we're planning on doing a bunch of other stuff and then Dave got sick and so he subbed and he's a guy that has played with myself and other friends of mine so he and he really worked well on my new album he really did a great job and um, uh, and then also uh, Steve Alamant who 
Um, you may have heard of the Yanks. They were a band that was on Lolita back in the mid '80s, and they're out of San Francisco. But um, he, he's the guy that sang harmonies on all the songs. Pretty much most of the higher harmonies are him, and I sang my lead vocal, and then a lot of lower harmonies. And then Bruce Hazen is a guitar player that is also in this kind of re refurbished Moberlys. I mean, the Moberlys, nobody in the original band that's in this kind of new Moberlys. We're playing tomorrow night in Seattle, actually. But um, we do sort of a review sort of of the Moberlys, and it's really fun. But um, Bruce and I go way back, and he was in a whole bunch of just a ton of bands, a, a band called Hi-Fi. You might have heard of They were did a bunch of stuff in England. But at any rate, those guys all played on the album. And, um, you know, I, and we just we just kicked out this this album and and uh, and Gary and I mixed it and and uh, Gary and I decided on which songs were the ones to do. And we recorded another cover song. It's like a medley of uh, uh, Prince, uh, David Bowie and a, a kink song. Um, and that um, didn't make the album, but I'm planning on releasing that on the next album I put out, which is almost finished, really, it's all covers album, and it's it's pretty good. I mean, I really I think it's going to be great. And we're going to record like maybe one more song for it, but I still got a long ways to go before I really want to release a new album because there's so much still to do with this uh, not changing. I really want to get this this thing really out there more, and I'm basically just starting on not changing. I'm really getting it out there and really getting getting the songs worked into my live show and all that stuff. You make it sound so fluid, but 40 plus songs in a period of time when you were shifting between a book and me, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, you know, it's, 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 it is amazing, but you know, I had the energy and I had the juice and um, I chose to, to spend it in that, in that way. And uh, it's something that it's kind of something that, you know, it's just an itch that really needed scratch. <laughs> I've been wanting to do it for a long time, but I hadn't had the opportunity because I had to do other things that I sort of had to do because of, you know, longer term goals. I mean, I fell in love with a girl that was, you know, six years old, seven years old at the time. And I wanted to raise her and make sure she had a, a safe home and, and things like that. And, and that was real important. And, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 long and short of it is um, that's just the way it went. You know, so yeah. um, I just I had the I had the had the juice and I had the time and the space to do it. And uh, you know, the kid was pretty well taken care of as far as getting to school and stuff. Although that was stuff I could do in, in the midst of everything else, along with her mom. Um, but uh, and then that wasn't just about the kid though. It was just also about you know the responsibility of getting a house together and things like that, that I made choices to, to, to do, you know, but at the same time, I always primarily made a living from playing music. So I had to look at it that way. Right. And I've also in my music, this is something that people maybe don't realize when you say that, but I've also in, in the context of the, the music scene up here in the Northwest, I've also played as many original songs as I could get away with in the, in the context of the gigs I was playing. Mm -hmm. So instead of being a band, like there's a lot of bands out there that play covers and go out there and make better money than me playing casinos or tribute shows or, you know, whatever it may be, I've just completely gone against that. So the, the, the living that I've made has been in the context of always being Jim Bass night and always presenting my music and then doing a certain amount of covers, but doing only pretty much covers that, I feel I can put something of myself into, right. you know, that, that mean, meaningful to me. So there's sort of a little bit of, there's a little bit of close and pull as far as playing places that, you know, that where they, they think that they want covers there. But I, I find that, you know, covers are fine. I mean, I like playing songs where I can connect with people that haven't heard me before that maybe will, you know, stick around and listen to some of my original tunes more readily if I play a few covers that they like, you know, and and if it's a song that I love anyway, it really doesn't bother me as much as playing like just the, the typical junk, you know. Yeah. Well, I sure given a lot, I've sure given a lot of quotes. Yeah. <laughs> Hope I didn't offend anybody. <laughs> uh, no, it just it it rounds out it rounds out this picture of who you are and who you're presenting yourself as as an artist, and we're really there's the more to it. 
Yeah. <laughs> there, there's more to it. I could tell you a lot more, but I'm trying to focus <laughs> this on something that you guys would even be, be interested in, you know, because I, I, whatever. But yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of wax like this. This is cool. Uh, Jim, I'd like to ask you about one of the songs on Not Changing, and it's track eight, Kurt Cobain. really jumped out at me I hope that somewhere somewhere in the stars you hear my song I hope you can understand the words and sing along and I was just you know when when we think about the Seattle scene when we think about the Pacific Northwest and Mm -hmm. the impact of the scene on contemporary music on popular music you know Kurt's name comes up Mm -hmm. and I was just curious where you know what inspired you or what drove you to write this song well, you know something. Um, I, I I like Nirvana. I've listened to a lot of Kurt's uh, music. I think he had a lot of really good ideas, and he had a, a, a lot of potential. And it's just a very sad story, you know, uh, that he died the way he did. When when he was almost to the point where he died, about two weeks before that point, or three weeks, or something like that, I had been talking to a guy who ran a juice bar near where I was living in Seattle, who was the guitar roadie for Nirvana, a guy named Ernie. And uh, he um, he and I had become friends over time. Um, and, you know, I was always kind of curious about what was going on with uh, Kurt, although I really it really wasn't something that I was, like, angling to try to get in with Kurt, you know. 
Uh, it's just kind of, you know, it just happened to be this guy that I would get like carrot juice in the morning from or whatever. And he, he and I just started talking about music and hearing that we share different ideas. And I said, well, you know, Kurt, you know, he, he's, he's kind of in a, well, he, he told me he's kind of in a writing slump and there hasn't really been any new songs. Well, I go, you know, I could probably help him out with that because I have a lot of song ideas and, and I could probably, I have a lot of, a fair depth of, of rock and pop history and things like that. And I can maybe help him out with some of his songs, you know, cause I've done that with a bunch of other songwriters, you know, never may be any, not that many people who were on drugs. I actually have people on drugs, but um, uh, I won't mention any names, but the, the key thing is, is that, you know, I said, you know, hey, you could introduce me to him. We could write some songs. That'd be cool. I know that kind of sounds like I'm trying to be, you know, trying to get in on the scene or something like that. But the truth is I probably could help him out. And he goes, well, well, you know, that's a good idea, except for I wouldn't wish that on anybody right now. He's just in too big of a mess right now. And so let's just wait and see if we can, so I'll check this out maybe in a little while, maybe things will calm down and I'll introduce you to him and maybe you guys can get together and play some music and see what happens or whatever. And so that was kind of a disappointment because he died and then all that happened. And, and then, um, you know, so I kind of felt that, you know, and, um, you know, but the, but if the other part of it is that, uh, that what that line means really to me is, is that, you know, Hey, I, this is a, this is my, this is my song about what I see, you know, what I, what I see from you, what I see, who, who you are. And, uh, and uh you know how much i thought you were really doing something great and uh maybe you were a little bit misunderstood and uh i understood you i hope you understand what i'm saying that kind of a thing i understood you i hope you understand that that's that 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 understanding that we have that maybe we have together of some of these some of these difficult things that you'd had to deal with maybe and maybe some of the some of the things that make you happy that i also make me happy about this this world you know so that's pretty much that's pretty much what it is that's about the best way i can describe it nice well sarai is the deep one she's going into like the deep lyrics for me the song that jumped out for me was track number five and on the chorus you're singing i'd rather be making love for a living so that's what (laughs) sarai is the deep one um so i'm hoping that well everyone thinks everyone thinks that that okay Tommy, not even my wrote that song and um you know and it's i mean it really is a i it to me i'm rather be making love for a living is it's about doing what you love to do and being able to make a living now you can make you can anybody can interpret that any way they want and admittedly it's sort of provocative it's sort of meant to be put out there for for a little laugh yeah and uh and sort of and, and, and sort of has sort of a a kind of a he he sort of dual meaning but at the same time i think that the basic premise behind the lyric and i think what to me what the the real um motivation behind the song was that you know whether it's playing music the music you love or um and 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 you know making a living or doing whatever it is that you love and making a living i'd rather do that than then do something I really don't want to do to make a living and then find find happiness elsewhere. Now, I'm not saying everybody else should do that because it doesn't often make sense to do that. But in, in my case, I'd rather do that. Wow. I like that answer. So it makes, okay. philosophically, philosophically, it's kind of, I'm making my statement and, and, and drawing my line. But, you know, I'm not saying that that's what everybody else needs to do. That's just what I'd rather do. I love right. that. I love that. Hey, so... <laughs> okay. Well, I'm making time on the old soft cell Well, my baby's sending dreams down to me From the bottom of a wishing well Somebody quick take a picture of me They got me working like a demon dog Well, I'm 
could easily afford And tis a far, far better thing I do And I like to do some more One time you in the recording of not changing who who helped you out in production or or oh know? the guy that helped me out his name is gary shelton he and his wife cheryl shelton are really good friends of mine for a long time in seattle and uh he's played in my band here and there mostly he's been a studio player um it's within you know, on recordings i've done and a studio engineer co-producer he and i kind of work together producing you know and uh so um he's just he's just this this guy that's always had his own studio and when i moved back here from los angeles in 92 we reconnected and we've just been working together uh on a lot of different projects since then uh, we didn't really start working together i don't think until about uh um 95 really we we're friends and stuff but we didn't we started maybe in about 95 or 90 um i remember i i wrote a musical for seattle children's theater called little rock which i have hope is going to have sort of a some sort of a resurgence um it was about the little rock nine i don't know if you know who the little rock nine yes. were okay yeah. Um, but it was about the Little Rock Nine, and it was funded, you know, by a pretty good grant from a couple of big corporations, and it was a great opportunity. And I got hired to do the job because of my perceived knowledge in American roots music, like the blues and rockabilly and 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 fifties pop and all the stuff that was going on in the midst of Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. So I got together with a guy named Rich Gray. And he was a more or less a professional uh, music musical theater uh, music director, musical uh, performer in in the Seattle area, and he's still doing that very successfully. Um, and he and I wrote all the, all the songs for it, and I put together the band to record sort of the backing track. We were originally going to try to have a live band in the show, then we decided to go with backing tracks, but we recorded this this all the, the soundtrack for the show, and then all the performers sang the songs to these soundtracks that we recorded and, and you know, put together around the show, and I hired Gary for that. And I believe that was the first thing that I hired him for, and we did that in 95, and, um, and then the show ran, and we did a couple of live performances with Gary, and other musicians, um, and uh, and so uh, that specific project, at, when the show closed in Seattle, it actually had about seventy thousand tickets sold altogether. It was a oh, pretty yeah. successful show as far as they they got a lot of schools to bring like the whole bunch of kids down, and it was just but it was a lot of a lot of people came and saw it. it was the, it was the children's theater event of the year in the Seattle Times, and uh, it was a successful local uh, production. And then it had a couple or had some other runs in Pittsburgh and Little Rock and Minneapolis and Washington D.C. and just a few. It was a very hard show to do because it was really had a, it required a lot of actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, it's just I don't even know much about theater, but it, it's when you have a big production like that, you, it's just hard to do it. Mm -hmm. And so um, it basically um, not every theater can do it, but that way. Um, and so uh, so there's that. And but um, I want kind of want to bring it back, but that was the first thing we did together. And then after that, we started working on the Jim Bass night thing, and we 
went back to my my uh, catalog and kind of remastered some of the old Moberly stuff for some of these reissues, and we started working on all that kind of stuff together. And then then uh, that turned into uh, that recovery room project, which he worked on every single track on that one. And then uh, and then he's all the other different reissues and things I've done. He's always helped me with. And then when this project came along, this was, that was the, obviously the person I was going to call and to start working on it with. So, um, he's just a, just a real, we have a lot in common. We both love the Beatles and, um, the kinks and that sort of that kind of stuff, the Bowie. And, uh, that's the kind of stuff we, we like in common. And we have a lot of other musical interests in common kind of grew up at the same time, listen to the radio and rock and roll and that stuff. So that's kind of where we come from. You know, this, this album, you know, just to tell you a little bit about the way it was recorded, it was me on the acoustic guitar and vocal and Gary on bass. And then that's how the album was recorded. We just recorded the, the vocal, acoustic guitar and bass and then built the album up from that. Usually, you guys, I don't know if you guys are musicians or have made records yourselves. Most yeah. of the times, people, okay, most times people do like the bass and drums first. You know, they do that, they get the basic track and then they build the song from that. We did it a different way. We did bass guitar and acoustic guitar and built it from that. Got what found a, a take that had the magic, the magic take with the bass and the guitar and the vocal. And then from there, built the record from there and got that, got the magic from just those three as opposed to having the drums first wow. and then built and there was it was the toughest on the drummer because the drummer had to like because when you have a track that's not cut to a click track we weren't working with any click track everything was kind of just going for a feel thing because you know we just decided that listening to all these great records in the past that this whole idea of everything being digital you know um, it, it's taken a lot out of songwriting, in my opinion. There's sort of not as much room to breathe for a song. So we really wanted these songs to, to get away from that. And so, you know, we just did it that way. And then Dave, the drummer, came in and he did a tremendous job because it was kind of like a moving target. Um, it, it's sort of like... Um, you know, skeet shooting or something like that. <laughs> Not that we've done any of that, but basically, he's got to be able if the if the if the if the if the bass and guitar and the vocal kind of start picking up, he's got to pick up with us. And if we kind of pull back, he's got to pull back with us. And he's got to figure out a way to kind of have this whole thing kind of just together. So he he's like as probably as important in this whole thing as anybody, the drummer, really, truthfully. Because he made it sound what it sounded like, and I think it sounded really well. And uh, so, um, and then once he did that, it was just pretty much up to uh, uh, just you know filling up the the spaces and just doing all the guitars and all the vocals, and, and that was pretty much all it was. We had one guy come in who's another friend of mine that that is a DJ in Seattle, a career DJ, and he came and did that introduction thing on "Living the Way I Want," which was kind of that. I wrote the the text of that. It was just basically a um, sort of a kind of a reminiscent of an old uh, '60s kind of style DJ, like talking about what's going on in town. And you know, it's called it's called uh, I think what he called like a bleeding up to the post or something like that. <laughs> kind of a radio turn where you, where there's like intros to a song and you go. And the guitar comes in, da, 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 da. Hey, by the way, it's going to be the, da, 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 da. here we are. Da, 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 da. And it's the Stones. I can't get, no, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. we just we just kind of just did it with, with my song and thought that was kind of a cool effect. And uh, John Carlucci from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Little Stevens Underground Garage told me I couldn't really do that on, on his show. So we, I, we edited it out just for his, his copy to play on, on his show. So, but, and they, that's one that they play on the underground garage. But, um, so, but that's, I mean, you know, I thought it was a cool idea and I still like it, but I guess it's, it doesn't really work that well for radio, I guess, for some reason. I don't know why. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there you go. Wow. So, uh, did I answer your question or do you, is, do you have a good follow up? Uh, no, uh, you gave me what I wanted and more. So thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. Well, actually, cool. We, we just passed the hour mark. So we wanted to make sure that our listeners, before we sign off, we did want to make sure that they knew where to get Not Changing. Could you help our listeners know where to find that record? 
Okay. Well, first of all, just about every download store out there has it. If you download music, um, be it uh, Google Play, Amazon, uh, Spotify, uh, Bandcamp, uh, it's everywhere. I would I would go to Bandcamp. It's the best deal, to be honest. I think that's the best deal. And uh, um, and then also uh, you can get the single on Big Stir of Never Get Lost back with Restless Night from the, my first CD. Um, and but aside from that, you can get it at Cool Cat Music. You can get it at Jam Recordings. You can get it at Music Millennium in Portland. And uh, I assume and it's just it's just not getting out with this distribution of hard copies. And I'm I'm gonna, I'm assuming that. Uh, before too long, you'll be able to get it on Amazon. Right now, you can get it on Amazon as a download. Um, and then, of course, you can always go to jimbassnightmusic.com um, and get one from me. Or I'm on Facebook. I'm actually on like three different Facebook pages. Or I'm also on Twitter. You can Twitter message me, too. I can get it to you that way. Or you can come to one of my shows, and you can get it that way. Nice. And um, the last question. Or you can, or you can, or you can, or you can write me. <laughs> I'm not going to give my street address over the phone. Just, no, just, no. just Facebook message me. Yeah. And uh, where is the best place on social media for people to be able to plug in and see where you're going to be playing live? Best place on social media for me to, to see where I'm playing live is Facebook. Okay. Uh, pretty much. Um, and but uh, but there's actually a, a printed schedule on jimbassnightmusic.com. Yeah. But if you want to like just if you want to just you know if you want to follow my Facebook feed, that's easier because it's easier to remember Facebook probably than it is to remember jimbassnightmusic.com. But if you get, I, I would think the best place is jimbassnightmusic.com because I've got like my printed schedule usually about six weeks out uh, right. on, on the current dates in, and times and stuff. Local Fantastic. And venues. And since yeah, you mentioned yeah. you had three pages on Facebook, which is the one with your tour schedule? Is it just Jim Bass Night or Jim Bass Night Music? I none of them are on. No, I that's <laughs> I, this is where I really do need marketing help. Um, I you know there, it's only on JimBassNightMusic.com, but on <laughs> um Facebook I do like announcements. So I'll do like, okay. hey, we're playing this weekend at the at the Reardon, you know, uh, Rec Hall in in. Uh, Spokane or whatever, you know, that's what I basically, I'll, I'll do that. And then people in Spokane, if they're following me close enough, know that, that I'm playing there, that kind of thing. Perfect. But I mean, it, I, it, it's not, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's coming along. It really is. This, this new album is really doing well. It's getting a lot of airplay and getting a lot of really good response. And uh, I really feel very happy that you guys were, were able to take the time to, to help me with it. Absolutely, absolutely. One hundred percent. Thank you so much for taking time. We know you're on your way to a show, so thank you for taking the time to talk with us and our listeners. And for our listeners, we're gonna post um, all the places that Jim mentioned of where you can find his music um, on our page, so uh, you can go follow him and go see him live. Yes. Go see him live. We support it i really look for i really look forward to getting to getting a chance to follow you guys in the future too i really what i've seen about you guys is fantastic and i'm looking to to really see more about that and we didn't really get a chance to talk about like all the different people in the quote-unquote paisley underground and all that kind of stuff because there was a lot of people that, that i was close to in that scene in la and new york and and europe and and so on and so forth so Hopefully we can maybe do this again and talk more about the, the good old days of, of the 80s or the 90s or whatever in that regard. <laughs> Sounds good. I think that'd be great. <laughs> yes. Sounds cool. great. Cool. Well, let's keep in touch. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being, thanks for being here with me. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great one, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, Soraya. Wow. We had a list of questions, most of which we didn't get to. I know, right? Yeah. Jim's a, a great storyteller. Oh, my gosh. And there's just story upon story and also, like, you know, just how the music comes together and the people that help it come together. Yeah. Incredible. And some of the names yeah, that, that he came know. up with. What, did he say he, that he roomed with Joey Ramone? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Wow. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And think about it. Nineteen years old goes out to New York, and you're, you're in some loft with Joey Ramone. Wow, wow. 
I, I that's mean, crazy. that's that's just pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. In and of itself. I really liked um, when he got into the lyrics on a couple of those songs that we talked about off the new album with the Kurt Cobain. There's not a whole lot of lyrics to that song, but I liked when you asked that what his response was. Yeah. No, it, it's just interesting. It's it's interesting how all that comes together and, you know, I think sometimes when we listen to songs, we can kind of imagine what the answer would be by the artist. And then when they blow your mind and they tell you something different, I think that's just cool. Yeah. Shows you, you know, artists aren't as transparent and predictable as you think. Yeah. And in this case, I'm, I'm glad that was the case. Yeah. And uh, Friends with the Plinsoles and so many punk artists. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah, I could tell. There's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more to dig into. Yep. But, so whew. next week, I believe we're going to be talking to Mark Hanley. Yes, sir. So that'll be, that'll be good, too. The one and only Mark Supreme. Yes, yes. He's put out some great stuff. I like, I'm... Looking forward to that conversation, too. Oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. And that's another guy that's a jack of all trades that can do it all. Yeah. We're going to have to <laughs> we're gonna have to come up with some good questions and, and probe his brain. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I have a feeling he's going to be a good storyteller. If his songs are any indication, he's a good storyteller, too. Nice. Well, I look forward to next week. Yes. So, gente, agrubiar. Groove on, Paisley people. Later! Huh.